Today, the Catholic Church is run by an all-male clergy. While there are more women in high-ranking positions than ever before, the bishops, priests, and deacons of the church, those capable of ordinarily conferring the sacraments and exercising ecclesial authority, remain all men. But it wasn't always this way. Or at least it might not have always been this way. A look to the early practice of the church, and even scripture itself, reveals the existence of a vocation no longer present in the church today. Deaconesses. Who were these women, and is it possible to ever have them again? Let's reclaim some history. Although scripture doesn't give a detailed account of the post-resurrection structure of the church, it might surprise some to know that it does present a few instances of women in leadership roles. In the first letter to Timothy, we read a passage about the requirements of deacons, and the specified gender is ambiguous. Deacons must be dignified, not deceitful, not addicted to drink, not greedy for sordid gain, holding fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Moreover, they should be tested first, then, if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. Women, similarly, should be dignified, not slanders, but temperate and faithful in everything. Deacons may be married only once and must manage their children and their households well. While it's entirely possible that the passage is meant to be only about male deacons, some scholars have pointed to the odd digression about women as indicating otherwise. Rather than talking about male deacons, women, then male deacons again, it's possible that the passage is distinguishing between male and female deacons. Another question arises from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In chapter 9, he writes, Do we not have the right to take along a Christian wife, as do the rest of the apostles, and the brothers of the Lord, and Cephas? At first glance, it appears that St. Paul is simply talking about marriage. But were the other apostles married? Was St. Paul married? Outside of Peter, we have no evidence of this. However, what we do know is that women traveled with the apostles, even in Jesus' time, as helpers, not wives, and that the word Adelphi, here translated as wife, can also mean sister. Which, side note, sort of makes you wonder about the Greeks, am I right? When you have the same word for two very different women? Ugh. The text itself doesn't answer our question one way or the other, but the early church seems to lean on the latter interpretation. St. Clement wrote, The apostles took women with them, not as wives, but as sisters, that they might be co-ministers in dealing with women in their homes. Similarly, St. John Chrysostom wrote, For the women of those days were more spirited than lions, sharing with the apostles their labors for the gospel's sake. In this way, they went traveling with them and also performed all other ministries." Of course, all of this would seem to be a major stretch had it not been for St. Paul's letter to the Romans, in which he writes, "...I commend you Phoebe, our sister, who is also a minister of the church." In the Greek, the word he uses for minister is none other than diakonos, deacon. So that settles it, right? Women were deacons in the early church, meaning that when it speaks of women traveling with the apostles, they were clearly there as ministers, not wives. Right? Not necessarily. On the one hand, it is clear from history that some position for women in ministry did exist. Both the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Chalcedon, expressions of the full authority of the church, mention the role of deaconesses. As late as the 7th century in the East, the Council of Trullo decreed that no woman could be ordained a deaconess before she is 40, implying that she could be made a deaconess after 40 and that it was considered an ordination. All throughout the early church, even up until the 12th century, we have records of deaconesses in wills, marked on graves, and even being given the title in convents of nuns. The fact that deaconesses existed in the history of the church is not in question, nor is it the slightest bit controversial. The word appears, in a positive way, in the documents of the church. What is in question, and quite controversial, is what we mean by that word, deaconess. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. Are we talking about full-blown ordinations like the men capable of serving at the altar and celebrating baptisms? Or are we talking about a female helper that aids the male presbyter? As far as the universal teaching of the church is concerned, the answer is unclear. The same Council of Nicaea states, And we mean by deaconesses, such as have assumed the habit, but who, since they have no imposition of hands, are to be numbered only among the laity. 
On the other hand, the Council of Chalcedon states, A woman shall not receive the laying on of hands as a deaconess until 40 years of age, and then only after searching examination. Meaning that she did, at some point, experience the laying on of hands, a gesture reserved for ordinations. That said, the Church definitely has instances, on a local level, of speaking definitively against it. At the Synod of Oran, church leaders wrote, Altogether, no women deacons are to be ordained. And at the Synod of Epione, leaders wrote, We abrogate the consecration of widows, whom they call deaconesses, completely from our region. Clearly, the idea of women having the same status of men was hotly rejected in some areas. And yet, that doesn't necessarily settle the issue. Not only do these statements represent only regional authority, there's enough evidence that these women did exist and that they were doing actual ministry. One of the best examples of this comes from Epiphanius of Salmis. There exists for the Church the order of deaconesses, not for the purpose of performing priestly functions or for the purpose of administration. Its purpose is to preserve decency for the female sex, whether in connection with baptism or in connection with the examination of women undergoing suffering or pain, or whenever the bodies of women are required to be uncovered so that they need not be seen by the men officiating, but only by the deaconess, who is authorized by the priest to minister to the woman at the time of her nudity. Women did not perform priestly functions, but they did assist and minister. It's why one of the liturgical texts of the time, the Apostolic Constitutions, states, The deaconess does not bless, and she does not fulfill any of the things that priests and deacons do, but she looks after the doors and attends the priests during the baptism of women for the sake of decency. Although it's hard to say definitively, it seems likely that what the Church meant by deaconess in antiquity was not the female equivalent to a male deacon, but a helper, someone who assisted in situations where a male presence might cause scandal. A fully formed female diaconate has probably never existed. But that's not to say that it couldn't exist in the future. One can certainly make the argument that women never served as acolytes, lectors, or extraordinary ministers of communion in antiquity either, and yet they hold these positions today. Women today are administrators of churches, chancellors of dioceses, and judges on tribunals, despite these things having never existed before. The Church has spoken definitively against the ordination of women to the presbyterate, because a woman cannot act in the person of Christ, but the presbyterate and diaconate are entirely different vocations. In 2009, Pope Benedict XVI updated canon law to clarify this distinction. In the Modo Proprio Omnium et Mentum, he states, Those who are constituted to the order of the episcopate or the presbyterate receive the mission and capacity to act in the person of Christ the head, whereas deacons are empowered to serve the people of God in the ministries of the liturgy, the word, and charity. Deacons do not act in the person of Christ. They do not take on his priestly character or ministry. The issue that excludes women from the presbyterate does not apply to the diaconate. Nor does it follow that ordaining women to the diaconate would be a slippery slope to the priesthood. The diaconate is a proper and permanent order distinct from the priesthood. One does not lead to the other because they each remain ends in themselves. Some have argued that women could not be ordained to the diaconate because it would be an honor placed upon women that Mary herself didn't receive. But this is a problematic line of thought. Surely, as a priest myself, my ordination does not elevate me above the Virgin Mary because ordination does not confer a higher status in itself. It offers the grace necessary to carry out the responsibilities of my ordination, but does not make me necessarily holier or more important than laypeople. Ordaining a woman to the ministry of Christ would not be a slap in the face to Mary any more than I am better than Mary. Oh, the internet and its ridiculous theology. So, where does this leave us? Women can be, so they should be ordained? Not necessarily. The question remains unclear, historically and theologically, but it is a valid question worth discerning. Unlike the question of presbyteral ordination, the Church has not definitively decided one way or another, and people are actively engaging the question right now. Pope Francis has recommissioned a study to investigate its possibility, and organizations like Discerning Deacons have made great efforts of late to share the stories of women in ministry. There is no doubt, this National Vocations Awareness Week, that women are called by the Holy Spirit to the active life of the Church. The question we have to answer is what we allow that call to look like.